are clear for hyper launch. Beep boop, beep boop, beep boop. Beep. Buzz, that was utterly terrifying, and I regret having joined you. Buzz like you to Star Command. Come in, Star Command. Why don't they answer? Hey, hey! Shh. The robots. The what? What is happening right now? Alicia? Oh no, that's my grandmother. But Socks, how long were we gone? Meow, 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 meow. Sixty-two years, seven months, and five days. What? And we're blasting off. Hi, my name is Garen Daly, and this is another Boston Sci-Fi Presents. And this episode is Summer Films of 2022. And this is an interesting panel we put together because we have three continents, three film festivals, three festival directors, one podcast. And joining us is Marta Calderon from London. Uh, boss, what, was it London Sci-Fi or Sci-Fi London? Which one is it? Sci-Fi. Sci-Fi London. <laughs> uh, Sci-Fi London, which is we're one, it's one of our friends. Louis Savvy is a great friend of ours, and and, and welcome and join uh, for joining us. And also Simon Foster from Sydney, of, of all places. Welcome, uh, Simon. Lovely to be here, Garen. Hi, Marty. Yeah, this was a, a real treat when I got the invite for this. It's um, I, I'm looking forward to chatting with you. So I thought we would start off with talking a little bit about how everyone is buzzing right about now about how. Top Gun Maverick has blown the uh, the doors off of the best gross on Memorial Day, and Khan Film Festival just opened up. And in my estimation, Top Gun was wonderful entertainment. It's not a great film, but it was wonderful entertainment. And Khan was disappointing. Uh, did, have you either gotten any buzz about either of those guys? Um, look, I've, I've heard similar things about Khan. I was able to do it virtually, but I, I didn't wasn't able to attend this year. So uh, the general feeling was that there were interesting films and plenty to uh, uh, write and read about, but nothing that jumped out as um, the future of cinema, uh, which isn't Khan's role to, to do. Um, and certainly in the, the genre space, there was some interesting work, a couple of which we'll discuss tonight. But but. Um, yeah, it was, it was a festival that is finding its feet again after two disruptive COVID years was the feeling that I got. And Marta, what about you? Anything? What, 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 is your ear no, on the... Uh, uh, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay, don't worry. Um, I was about to say, I couldn't attend Cannes this year. Um, it, we were doing Sci-Fi London at the, at the time that Cannes was going on, so I couldn't attend. But yes, I did hear that nothing was really, you know, nothing big to pick up or nothing that it was so interesting, but everyone was there. It was the first year that everyone could come back and at least it brought everyone from the cinema industry together. And that's, you know, one of the beautiful things about it. Uh, and yeah, the whole thing with Top Gun is just so big at the moment. I'm actually looking forward to watching next week. Um, so yeah, I hope it's going to be as good as entertaining as you're saying. But you know, while well, I got you here, and, and I, this was, un, I hadn't really thought about this before. I mean, we just did our festival in February, and we were like literally the first festival out in Boston, and the pandemic was just winding down. Our attendance was not as good as it has been in previous years, and it was kind of tough. And I'm wondering what your experiences were with attendance at your festivals. Um, well, I'll, I'll of course, to... it's, it's a Marta, why don't you go first? Yeah, sorry, Marta, you go. I should, I should have prefaced that better. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. Um, of course, people, it's still a bit, you know, it's a bit difficult for them to go back to the cinema, to go back to be sociable with everyone and all that. But uh, I think our numbers were quite good. And we had a really fun, really good festival. We had many filmmakers come in and everyone's really grateful of, uh, of being back and being in person again. So I think we're experiencing the recovery of the industry at the moment. And I think it's going to be really good in a few months, but yes, of course, this is still on the way to it. And Simon? Well, it's really interesting that the three of us are here because my, I'm sort of in the final stages of planning 2022. Um, we'll, we'll be having our festival in August. So our last one was in November last year and we sort of popped up. We found this window in the COVID lockdown situation here in Sydney that allowed us to have our festival um, it was a bit shrunken down. It was over three days rather than the five we had the year before. Um, and 
our festival showed growth across every front except in ticket sales. We just couldn't generate um, yeah. that enthusiasm to get people out of their houses with so much um, so much sort of unsure nature in the air and unsure sort of about how to go to the movies. So, yeah, we, we suffered a bit in ticket sales last year, which is our main aim to reverse this year, I think. And um, so while there's still an enthusiasm and still excitement for the, the festival experience, we're hoping to sort of get back to the stage where you were just at Marta with, with London and, and get that excitement and get the visitors and get the ticket buyers back in the, the mood again this year. Well, you know, it, it's, it's kind of funny. We're, we're hoping that people are going to be coming back to the theaters, but our first film that we're going to talk about for the summer of 2022 was literally causing people to leave the theaters. <laughs> And, and that is that is Cronenberg's Crimes of the Future. And, and here's a clip to give you, and we'll talk a little bit about it when we get on the other side. This is a much more dangerous place now that pain has all but disappeared. Surgery is sex, isn't it? Is it? Mm. You know it is. Surgery is the new sex. I don't like what's happening with the body. In particular, what's happening with my body. Which is why I keep cutting it up. So I, I, everyone I, I, who, uh, the reports that I read, I, I haven't seen the film yet, and I'm going to go see the film. I am a Cronenberg fan. Uh, talk about the body uh, horror and the body being all, all that thing. And, and I just love the fact that an 80 year old man is still shocking audiences. Um, so, Marta, what, what's, what's your impression of this film so far? Honestly, I'm so excited to go and watch this film. I've been looking forward for this film for years. You know, the main reason why I started working in cinema was because of Cronenberg. I watched a Cronenberg film when I was a teenager, and I was like... That's oh, that, that's why do. you got warped. That's how you got, you know, your <laughs> brain got... No, it oh, was because Cronenberg did it to you. That's why we're doing what we're doing, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm just so excited to watch it because it looks like you know, it's going to shock me. It's going to be different again. I really hope it has that feeling of body horror. I heard that, because I don't know if you guys watched um, Titan at the beginning of this year, um, yeah. the French body horror film. Um, and I heard that it has some some touches kind of similar to that film. So I'm really excited about watching this film. And Simon, what are you thinking? Well, if they start distributing T-shirts with surgery is the new sex written on it, then they don't have got a hit on their hands. Oh, this is this is for me, Cronenberg back in, in um, Videodrome, Naked Lunch Territory, and he's made body horror mainstream in the past with The Fly, um, but he hasn't made that sort of chilly, arty, ugly concept film mainstream. Nobody, well, you know, they became cult hits, but they were Naked Lunch and Barton Fink. They were very small theatrical releases. So... I don't know if this will bridge the gap. It's going to be a real test of what a the distributor is willing to do with a film like this. How um, heavily they're going to go in for a wide release or a staggered release, or they're looking for critical support, or they're just going to generate controversy based on it. Um, so yeah, this is while it's also one of the most anticipated films of the summer for me. It's also a a real sort of testing ground as to how these sort of films in this kind of environment get marketed and and, and are released. That's actually a really good point, because uh, I, one of the things that I follow is I'm following a lot about what's going on in the streaming world. And in particular, I think the big buzz a couple of weeks back was the announcement from Netflix of how poorly their uh, subscriptions are going and how there was a great decline. Uh, and I also read about how that there was that battle going on in Netflix between the people trying to create the quality product and the people trying to just to create lots of product. And the quality product people got kicked out and the lots of product people took over. And that's why when you go to Netflix now, you see all these kind of like not so good shows mm -hmm. and that are just, you know, they're, they're, they're like not even B movies, they're C movies. Yeah. Um, and now they're talking about going back into theaters to do platform releases and marketing and stuff like that. And, and one of those films is a film called Spiderhead based on, I think it's a book. Um, and it has a great cast in it. And here's a clip of, from that film. That's Spiderhead. We're proud of our work. Your presence in this facility, while technically a punishment, is a privilege. Where have you been? Drug study. In science, we have to explore the unknown. 
They've been testing me up and down. A lot weirder stuff than usual. This is new frontier stuff here. Before we begin, I need your permission to administer to him for you. This place can really mess with your head. Drip on. Acknowledge. Drip on. Acknowledge. Acknowledge. Yeah, acknowledge. Let's do this. Well, that little scream. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really don't have a lot of expectations with this film. I, I think it'd be mildly diverting, but again, it's, it looks like it's a Netflix, you know, kind of a knockoff film. That's kind of what I'm looking at. Eh? And Mar uh, Simon, what do you think? I think it's going to get a lot of attention. Um, it's going to be the next film that hits the public space for the director, Joseph Kaczynski, after Top Gun Maverick. So um, there's a... a a, a bit of a pull there that Netflix probably, probably weren't expecting when they when they programmed it. Um, it is you're absolutely right. It is coming on the back of a a lot of Netflix films which have been fairly subpar. Um, they're finding eyeballs, but things like the Adam Project, and it's not just Netflix that are doing it. Amazon did it with that terrible Mark Wahlberg thing from oh, that, what was that Paramount Plus? I can't remember from a couple of months back. So these are the films that may have taken up cinema space in past years as, as kind of programming titles or, um, or or just sort of stuff that puts bums on seats in between the bigger films. So if they're planning to go back into cinema with, with films like Spiderhead and stars like Chris Hemsworth and Miles Teller, um, I'm keen to see how the exhibition space deals with that because it was only a couple of years ago that I was talking to exhibition people who were saying, we don't want Netflix in our foyers. We don't want the branding all over our cinemas that only gives them that only bolsters them up so it's going to be a complete turnaround from both netflix to put their films back into cinemas and from cinema owners to say yeah welcome netflix let's let's work together yeah marta i saw you nodding your head there you you, you agree i uh, know of course um so netflix has created this product that is the netflix product and then if they try to put that back on theaters as, as Simon is saying, I don't think theaters want that. Like, you know, it's a product that is created for Netflix. It's a product that is created for people to stream from their houses, and but it's not it's not going to be filling seats in a theater. I don't I don't think because um, it's it's an easy it's an it's an easy watch. It's something that you want to watch at home. You want to watch in your in your living room. But I don't think they can go back to theaters with these kind of things. To be honest. See, I look at I look. Sorry, Garen, I'll just jump in. I look at Spiderhead, and I think it's the same sort of couple of big stars doing big, dumb action stuff like Uncharted was. And Uncharted was a, a, a big cinema hit despite being a terrible film. So they're starting to find this balance where the small screen and the big screen content is really blurred. Um, I know that Netflix released a couple of, you know, that, I don't know around the world, but don't look up the Leonardo DiCaprio thing. That went into cinemas here in Australia for a couple of weeks ahead of the Netflix launch. And I know there's been been other stuff along the way but then you get the Charlize Theron film The Old Guard um, that that was always and only a, a, a Netflix title so it's going to be difficult for, for the industry to find a balance in this regard but but there, I think I believe that they're going to have to and I think that the next film is a perfect example of it and that next film is, is called Neptune Frost which is just coming out right about now uh, Saul Williams, I believe, is the director of it. It is Afrofuturism. I, I, let, let's take a look at, look at it and, and explain why independent filmmakers need theaters. <laughs> One justice agony, one little black girl agony is an opposing. So, so we've it, 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 that clip is not the best clip, and this is one of the things that happens with when you have these independent films. I mean, I, I remember the first time I saw, I think I saw it in Toronto last year, uh, I, a virtual Toronto, uh, but I remember the opening sequence where it takes place in Africa. And there being uh, all these almost indentured servants slash slaves are being forced to mine diamonds. And all of a sudden, they're pounding and they're beating of the, of the, of the hammers and the breaking of the rocks. 
becomes a dance and the music is there with a dance and it's like wow how good is this and then the whole thing turns into this wonderful sci-fi film um and i just can't see someone like netflix taking the courage to show a film like that where a movie theater or a good programmer is going to take that chance to show that film to sh to first of all you know laud the 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 director and to sh bring it to the audience's attention and i think that's our job isn't it yeah so i came across to this film when i was in the berlinale this year and um and I was so impressed because as well as you're saying, this, this clip is not really showing what the film is about because it's a musical. So they spend the whole film singing as well and dancing and it has that feeling on those neons and everything. It's just, it's just such a fantastic film. It's so beautiful and it's so well made. And of course, it's not, it's not something that I expect to be in Netflix. Uh, for example, in, in the UK, there's this platform that is one of the online platforms that is taking more space than Netflix at the moment, which is movie. And uh, it's a platform that is really becoming really big here. And they do have this kind of independent titles, a bit different than what you're gonna find in Netflix. And they do this kind of releases as well. It's, it's interesting to see how in different countries this platform works is for example in in the uk or in europe netflix yes of care of course it's a big thing but there is another independent uh streaming platforms that are working around and that they are really big and they have these kind of films going on um some breaking news for the boston sci-fi podcast uh, i can announce that we've got neptune frost for the the sydney premiere we'll be showing it at our festival it's the first time i've told anyone what we're screening at all so i'm very excited and yeah. i'm and i've booked it sight unseen and based entirely on reputation um you won't be disappointed you will yeah, not be I, disappointed we've aligned it, it, ourselves it's, it's imaginative in ways that i you know just like my writer said there is a a life force to this film that you don't necessarily see all the time and the music is is really good it's it's hip-hop it's 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 afro it's it, and it's got and it's got a lot of that afro futurism which is uh you know some of the the, the folklore of, of africa is is permeating throughout the film and that's great we also think, and, and to your point about seeing these films in cinemas and not on streaming platforms, we think this is a real sort of festival-defining film. This sort of says this is the kind of stuff we want to bring to Sydney. Yes, yes, we'll program the spaceships and ray guns sort of sci-fi, but we're also bringing a, a, a more intellectual, we're also bringing an international, we're bringing a, an adventurous and progressive sort of programming style to, to what we do. Um, so films like Neptune Frost and a couple of years ago we had uh, Shahid Amin Scales, which was the, the UAE film about the village and the mermaids and, and those sort of things are, are what, we'd, what we want to go out there and say, you know, we're, we're taking on, we're not taking on, you know, the other genre festivals or, you know, in fact, we're working with those guys, but we are taking on the programming strategies of the Sydney Film Festival and the Melbourne Film Festival, the big sort of international festivals that pride themselves to, to a lesser extent every year with bringing an international flavour. More often than not, they're just sort of premiering the theatrical stuff that's going to turn up at our multiplexes in a couple of weeks anyway. So there's a gap to fill that Netflix isn't providing, that the big funded film festivals aren't providing, and that's why Boston and London and Berlin and, and Sydney sci-fi festivals are so important. I, I mean, I, you know, you're speaking to the converted here, you know, yes, that's, I know. What we do and that's what we like to do. Uh, the next film, though, I, I have to say is it, it's come from a mainstream actor uh, who is doing some uh, d directing uh, work. And I've, I was really impressed with her Vigilante, uh, which is her first film that I believe that she made. And that's Olivia Wilde, who's a good actor unto, her, unto herself, but is really starting to show some chunk. And her new film is called Don't Worry Darling, which stars the, the everyone's darling right now, Florence Pugh. And here's, a, here's that clip. Welcome to the Victory Project. We're all here because we believe in the mission. What are we doing? Changing, Changing the, world. the world. What are we doing? Changing, Changing the, the world. world. That's right. What do you think they're really doing out there? What do you mean? The one thing they ask of us is to stay here. Where it's safe. Do you even know what the Victory Project actually is? Have you ever asked? Do you? 
please. What's actually happening? Stop it, Alice. What if this place is dangerous? What if Stop what it! No. Jack. It's okay. I'm curious to hear where she's going with this. So it's got a it's got a Stepford Wives vibe. It's got a little Pleasantville going on there, but in a dark side. Um, I mean, I don't know much more than that about it. Just what I've seen from the trailer. I, have you guys heard anything about this film at all? That's a big no, huh? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've been tracking it since that trailer. It's a great trailer, and it's got kind of that secret society feel about it. So there's a bit of Get Out maybe in there, and you're not quite yeah. sure what the, the issues are that are going to be going to be raised by this and you're absolutely right about olivia wilde she has um i having just ragged on the sydney film festival i did see vigilante at the sydney film festival and it was uh it was a terrific film um so she sort of very much in that um really interesting group of female directors who are working in a in a genre space at the moment um one of uh, a young female director called Emily Dean. Uh, she's got a uh, one of the episodes of the most recent Love, Death and Robots show on Netflix, um, and she does some amazing animated work. I am a huge fan of Anna Lily Amipour. Um, her three films, The Bad Batch, Mona Lisa and the Blood Moon, and Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, are, are really interesting visions in, in a genre space. Um, and I'm a huge fan of a Swedish film called Aniara from a couple of years ago, and it was co-directed by um, oh. Pelle Kagerman. Yeah. Pelle Kagerman's a, a great director as well. So there's some really interesting uh, women directors working in, in the sci-fi space. And Marta, you know, I, I think you would probably be best to speak with is this is our genre space, as, as Simon said, a, a welcoming place for female directors or other directors who might not get a chance uh, doing some other films like that? Are, are we as welcoming as we'd like to think we are? Uh, you know, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> like, if you if you look at if you look at the films that are coming out every year and like how many are they directed by women, and like how many are like you know, big women voices and all that is so difficult to find something within the sci-fi or within fantasy. So difficult. Every year I spend hours and hours looking for interesting sci-fi films that are directed by women or non-binary people. And it's always so difficult to find. But in the last three or four years, it's starting to pick up. So as Simon was saying, he was mentioning some of, you know, the great films that are coming out in the last few years from big, amazing, in um, women directors and I remember last year we had Glass House at Sci-Fi London that was directed by a woman it was such an amazing beautiful film and a couple more uh, but yes it's, it's always it's always difficult it's not you know it's the kind of thing that women don't think that they can make it's just such a big male presence within the sci-fi or within the fantasy that is difficult but I think it's becoming better with the years you know, well, can I, I just jump? Go ahead, Simon. Uh, it, it's such a shame that that's that that's the case because when you look at the careers of some of the great women directors we've had, some of their best works have been in sci-fi. Claire Denis has done some oh, great sci-fi yeah. work. Yeah. Um, um, Catherine Bigelow. I mean, Strange Days. When they when they're allowed within, or, or when they fight not not I shouldn't say allowed, but when they fight for their vision and fight for the um, the, the film they want to make in the sci-fi genre, it's always always but it's it's generally a, a really interesting perspective a really fresh perspective it offers a new um look or a really insightful look at, at, at uh, issues and from a from a science fiction point of view so it, it just seems insane to me and i've already mentioned scales but it was directed by a uh, a woman shahid amin uh, it was the first sci-fi feature made um in the uae by a woman director it was the uae's uh, official entry in the Oscars that year for the for the international film section. So, once again, given the opportunity, and there's just not enough opportunities, but given the opportunity, women directors provide some extraordinary works. Yeah, I certainly hope so because everything you know, I, I I look at again some of the films that you cited. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure Marty, you've seen some shorts that you know we don't necessarily get to talk about, but we get you know at, at Boston we we show uh, about eighty shorts. And we and I would say about anywhere, depending on the year, anywhere from 25 to 45 percent are women directors. Mm -hmm. And the, the, it's, it's quality stuff. It's really and the visions are really 
they, they snap. You know, I'm not sure if that's a good enough word to say, but you know, they're there. They they have the the, the capability. I want to see more. I want more. You know. Mm -hmm. Um. Now we're going to change gears a little bit, and we're going to go into that what I call the oddball UK comedy realm of a film called uh, uh, Brian and Charles. And I I have to assume that they're probably better known in the UK than they are anyplace else. But but here's a clip so that you can we can talk a little bit about oddball humor. I never thought I'd make anything as amazing as Charles. You built my body. I built his body. And my tummy is a washing machine. And his tummy is a washing machine. So happy together. Keep showing to people. Why not? I should call you up. And what you want for them? Oh, he's not for sale. You Why are you wearing that? I feel pretty cool, man. Imagine I want to go on an adventure. Everything is lovely. It's not all lovely. Stay down, boy. There's a big old world out there. The big perilous world. Oh my gosh. Okay. What was that? Okay. Okay. Just perilous. Just so just very perilous. perilous. Well, any trailer that has the turtles happy together is always going to get me because that's, I love that song when I was growing up. Um, um, Marta, do you know anything about Brian and Charles? Oh my God, I've been following this since I knew this was happening. So um, a few months ago, I saw uh, that it was released on Sundance and then I watched the short film. Uh, I don't know if you guys watched the short film, but this film is coming from a short film. So the director made yeah. the short film and then from that film, from that short film, the film came. The short film is really cute but at the end is a bit sad i don't know it's really 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 good and i can't wait to watch this film i actually have tickets to and watch it next week in oh. london oh yeah yeah super excited because it's coming to sundance london next week so i'm literally just going to watch it next week because i'm i can't wait it just looks so fun and so interesting like exactly the kind of thing that i want to watch so I, let me just follow that a little bit up on that. So what is it about the water that you guys drink in the UK that creates these weird guys like Brian and Charles, uh, you know, the, 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 the Monty Python and all that? What, what, do you have any theory about that at all? No idea. <laughs> to be honest, that's that's the kind of person that you have to say for Louis because he's actually British. But I'm just here, you know. I yeah. couldn't tell you. But I just love the British humor. Anything that they can give me, I'll take it. You know. And, and Simon, you know, what what are you thinking about the, this kind of stuff? Well, I hadn't even heard of Brian and Charles until I got your running sheet for this podcast. So I did a bit of research on it. In answer to your question, where, where does this humor come from? Um, and certainly dating right back to the um, Pete Cook and Dudley Moore and Monty Python days. And Fireman's Other Ball, yeah, that was okay. Yeah, yeah, that sort of stuff. That comes out of their, their university and their college background. It's such a sort of a, I don't know if it's so much now, but there's a real sense of uh, freedom and a real sense of creativity in, in a lot of what they do there. And and uh, these sort of creative minds are are encouraged. And, and the comedic scene, just the stand-up comedy scene in the UK, um, I actually thought that was the comedian Joe Wilkinson in the lead, but it's not. It's another actor. He's very similar, and he's got that kind of very funny approach. So this looks like a lot of fun. There was a, a film maybe 10 years ago called Grabbers, which was kind of a small-scale British Irish yeah. sci-fi film, and it had a similar sort of um, sort of lo-fi but very engaging. There, yeah, there was a, there was it. another one called Canaries too. Oh, Canaries! Um, yeah, I programmed Peter's Peter film. Peter yeah. Stray directed that. Who's a good friend of the festival? Yeah, and yeah. We, there was a couple of uh, speaking of which, we had a couple of New Zealand films that were had that kind of off ball humor. And uh, you know, again, I love it because it's just it's out there, it's crazy, and it's smart. And I love smart humor like that. And um, it also shows that. Like, oh, sorry, I'll jump in, Garen. The the um. The, the small scale sci-fi drama or small scale sci-fi comedy can often work really well within, you know, you can have a very high concept, something like Safety Not Guaranteed. Or, I was just thinking or, about that one, yeah. Or recently Save Yourselves um, can be a, a very uh, small scale film but deal with really big high concept issues and laughs and drama. Um, and, and, you know, some of my favourite films have been that kind of movie. And well, the next one we have is is a genre film. I mean, I grew up and I cut my bones uh, as a programmer booking rom coms from the '30s because they were just they were just delightful. You know, all those you know uh, you know screwball comedies, the Marx Brothers. You know, all those things were going on. 
And then rom-coms have really just kind of died out because the tension was no longer there. Because in the old comedies, it was all about going to bed. And because you couldn't show that on screen, it became the tension that it was that was underneath everything. But then when as soon as we got a little more sophisticated, it ended. So here's here's where they're taking the rom-com and they turn it into a sci-fi sci film. And the film is called Press Play. You are now recording the very first song on our mixtape. <laughs> You're gonna think I'm crazy. No, no, I won't. What? Um, what? I'm from the future. Like, like, ho hoverboard future? I'm not kidding. You're gonna die. I don't really know how to say this without sounding crazy, but, um, I can travel through time. How is this even possible? I don't know, but every time I play a song on the mixtape, it takes me back in time to the moment we first heard it together. Laura? Oh, my ear! What are you talking about? What, what, what? You know, uh, I, I mentioned this in our pre-production pre meeting. I've always wanted to say I'm from the future. I love time travel movies. And Safety Not Guaranteed is another example of that. I, I mean, this doesn't look all that great, to be honest with you. It kind of looks like they just used the time travel to create a little tension for the rom-com. And I don't know, maybe, did you get anything else out of it other than that? What do you think? I mean, it looks really sweet. It looks really, really sweet. That was the thing, you know. It's cute. Um, but yeah, I was thinking as well when you said on the on just before we started the podcast when you said, "Oh, I always wanted to say that." I always thought, "What would it happen if someone comes to me and tells me this? <laughs> what the fuck would I say? What will I do?" <laughs> Honestly, I was like, um, "I can't see myself in that situation, running away very, very fast." One of these <laughs> days, we should we should do something about time travel movies where it is because what is what is that marissa tomei uh movie where she travels in time or she meets somebody who says he's from the future I, i'm drawing a blank on it right now but there's there's a whole bunch of things uh simon what did you what did you think of that trail well first of all we always assumed you were from the future garen so there's no need to get oh thank you <laughs> um the I, I, I'm a sucker for the teen romance. So, yeah, this looks cute and fun. And with the sci-fi element, that adds to it as well. Um, they're sort of working. And once again, this goes back to the small-scale sci-fi storyline. Time Traveler's Wife was the Eric Banner, Rachel McAdams film, is, is now up on television again with yeah. Rose Leslie. So there's there's this sort of struck me as that kind of element as well, that there's that it's able to play with time travel which is such an ambiguous idea the way it's used in science fiction movies i guess most most sort of sci-fi time travel stories tend to stick to a, a basic set of rules but then make up their own stuff that they have to adhere to for their storyline which i'm which i'm fine with and this looks this looks kind of sweet enough we programmed a film a couple of years ago called the queen of the lizards which was a, a mexican film um about a woman who has a summer fling with a guy who turns out to be an alien and as they break up at the end of summer um he's sort of got a bum around with a before the ship turns up and it was a a very small scale very contemporary sort of romantic comedy um but done in a a very uh inventive way and um so once again when they're able to when you're able to bring fresh ideas to sort of old genre beats then it, it, it still has some life left in it well we're, we're winding up with, with with what we wanted to cover in this this uh, boston sci-fi presents and now we're going to go into the film that we want people to see for the summer and and marta you've got one that that i think played at your festival is that correct yeah so i would like to talk a little bit about manfish oh god sorry guys <laughs> i completely <laughs> lost my voice just before the, this podcast which is really silly this never happened to me before but it's also pretty late at your, it's like 12 30 at night with your house where you are exactly. right okay so i was having dinner tonight and i was talking to my friends and suddenly this happened i was like no <laughs> <laughs> so, so this, um but yes, I wanted to talk about Manfish. Manfish is a, a work, we had the world premiere at Sci Fi London. It's a British film and it's a comedy about um, a man fish, which is instead of a mermaid, is the half fish and the bottom, well, it's not fish, basically. <laughs> um, so 
It's a really, really great film, a really funny uh, British comedy. I will say to everyone to keep your eye out for that, for this film and to go to festivals because this is going to be a festival film. So definitely keep your eye out for this film. We'd show a clip of it, but it's so new. I don't think that there is a clip out for it. And so that so everyone who's watching this, the film is called Manfish. It won best film. It won best film, correct? Yes, yes, the best one film. One best film at, uh, at Sci-Fi London, London Sci-Fi. Uh, I, see, I, I always get it mixed up. Um, <laughs> but anyways, Man Fish is it. Uh, Simon, what, what's on your list? Of the films we've discussed, I think I'm most excited for, for Don't Worry Darling. It seems to be the one that has the, the, the highest aims and I'm most and sort of excited about seeing. Not on our list is the Dan Trachtenberg Predator prequel called Prey, which is coming in early August in the US and probably rolling out around the world. Um, Trachtenberg. This, this is a prequel, right? This is a prequel to Predator. It is, yeah. It's it's. They're calling it an origin story. It's set um, in the Comanche Nation three hundred years ago, and the lead is a young uh, female warrior who sort of is fighting to protect her tribe from the the the, the uh, first arrival of the predator that went on to sort of beat up Arnold Schwarzenegger and all number of actors. Let's in let's sh let's show a clip of it, and you can pick it up when it, at the end of the clip. Yeah, that's anyone who knows the predator iconography, you know, the, the dots on the head, you know. So, I mean, uh, you know, do, who is Trachtenberg? So he, he came to everyone's attention with 10 Cloverfield Lane, the Mary Elizabeth Winston right. film a yeah. couple of years ago, and he's been directing episodes of The Boys since then. Prey has been bumped around the release schedule for a while now, um, held up by COVID. Um, but it's always been high on my radar and, and what I'm trying to do with the festival because, A, it has a, a, a really strong female lead in an actress called Amber Midthunder, who's from the who's a Native American. Um, and it, it sort of deals with a piece of film mythology in, in the predator creature and, the, the you know, the predator storyline, but really sort of takes it out of anything that we, we've seen in the past. So... It's slated for a Hulu release, I think, on the 5th of August in the US. Um, how that's going to happen as it rolls out around the world, I'm not sure. I'm I'm banging on the door of our local Fox distributor to try to get it as our opening night film, and I'm uh, having some headway, but it's a, it, we'll see what happens. So uh, fingers crossed. Well, my, my, the one that I'm excited about is from George Miller, you know, the guy that did Mad Max and, you know, uh, Bay Pig in the City. So, you know, he's he can go either way. And and we'll show a clip of that and then we'll talk a little bit about it on the other end. I like it. Whatever it is, I'm sure it has an interesting story. So what would you wish for? What is your heart's desire? I do have a question. What does one do with three wishes? You'll see. There's no story about wishing that is not a cautionary tale. We all have desires, even if they remain hidden from us. But it is your story, and I cannot wait to see where it goes. Oh, how it might end. <laughs> Hello. He'll be staying for a while. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, you know, it, again, you never know. It's good, but it looks incredibly inventive. And, it, and I love it when somebody who is smart and creative takes a known property and just takes it on a new ride. Uh, and anything with Ildris is is, is is just I've got to watch it, you know. And Tilda Swinton is great, so I, that that's that's my that's my exciting film for the year. I mean, 
And I think that's coming out in August, you know. Also, so. with mixed um, mixed reviews coming out of Khan, though, there were those that really got behind it and those said that it, it seemed like a, a, a fairly indulgent flight of fantasy. But anything with Tilda Swinton gets me excited. She made a film, which I only saw a couple of weeks ago at a, a local session called Memoria, which was the, the which was called this, this sort of half strange... Oh, I do apologise. That's a rookie error. Um, the, uh, from the Thai director... Um, oh, I should have practiced this. A picture pong, Vera Sethakal. I do good for I do. easy for you to say. Yeah, well, kind of. I almost had a stroke doing that. No, it's it's a, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful film. Tilda Swinton does amazing work, and I'm keen to see what she does with George Miller. All right. Well, we we have to wrap up. So, uh, uh, Marta, why don't you give a last plug uh, for what anything you guys are working on in London? Well, we just finished the festival and we're going to have the 48 hours coming on in September. So oh, cool. anyone around the world can participate. Uh, we will put the call out in August and you just have to sign up. We will send you um, a line of dialogue, a prop and a title for your film. And then you have 48 hours to make your film, send it back to London. And then we will have um, our jury picking up the best films and a big party just towards the film. Here. Well, we know so, that yeah, Louis, Louis, Louis always throws a good party. You guys always throw a good party. That we you know. <laughs> Simon, what do you? What, what, you, you said you're just wrapping up your programming. Yeah, we have a deadline on June 27 is our official deadline for the 2022 festival. We we launch August 25 through 28 at, a, at event cinemas here in Sydney, and then the following weekend we're doing our first national rollout. We're going to six other sites around the country, um, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide. Uh, so it's kind of a big deal. But, yes, we, we are still seeking. We've had a, a, a very strong sort of bunch of submissions already, stuff that's come to us via our Film Freeway site um, and that I've been able to source through through some of the festivals. Um, I saw this terrific film that played Khan called The Mountain from Thomas Sandoval or Saldoval. That's a very engaging film. I saw, yeah. I saw half of that. I didn't see the whole thing, unfortunately. Oh, wow. Well, you missed the beat. There's a very big Well, you know, you know what? It was very slow at the beginning. Yeah. But it yeah, still yeah. maintained a, 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 a hold on you. Yeah. Uh, I just had another meeting going on, so I had to jump to that meeting. So I, I, I missed it, so. Uh, the twist is great, so do try and catch the end of it. So, yeah, we're still going through the the, the stages of, of programming, watching these amazing films from all over the world. So, so it's been a pleasure talking to you guys. Well, I want to thank both of our guests, Simon Foster from the Sydney Science Fiction Film Festival in Sydney, Australia, and Marta Calderon from London Sci-Fi Film. Is it London's again? Again, I keep getting it wrong. Jesus, Garen, give it to you. <laughs> Sci-Fi London, Garen. Sci-Fi London. Sci-Fi London. <laughs> Sci-Fi London Film Festival. Um, for Boston Sci-Fi, the big thing that we've got out is we're going to be using our virtual film festival in July, and we're going to be doing what we're calling a screenwriter shootout, where we're going to get screenwriters to be on screen, do an interactive thing, where they're going to write a short story or short screenplay. Then we're going to have a, a live read with people wow. and people are going to be, be able to enjoy it. It'll be on our Filmocracy, uh, a virtual site. Um, so, But we're wrapping up now. Uh, I want to thank Mark Sherwood, who was our director, who was able to bring in all those clips together. Um, again, uh, want to thank Simon and, and Marta. By all means, go to bostonsci-fi.com, buy tickets. And to close out, we're going to give you the monster film of the summer of 2022. So we'll see you next time. If our world's gonna survive, what matters is what we do now. I can use your expertise. You coming or what? A baby raptor? I made a promise we would bring her home. You made a promise to a dinosaur? Yeah, why? Everybody hold on to somebody. Can't be right. What is that? Biggest carnivore the world has ever seen. Run! See? Not so bad. <laughs>